And we move uh, quickly now to a, an iconic peacekeeper who works at the grassroots in India's uh, troubled Northeast and region, uh, Patricia Mukim, uh, who's a social activist, writer, journalist, and the editor of Sri Long Times. She's a former member of the National Security Advisory Board of the Government of India and has served as a member of the National Foundation for Communal Harmony under the Home Affairs and the Minister of Interior. She's a, foundation, a founder of We Care, an NGO that works in Shillong and is involved in advocacy against militancy in Meghalaya, which is, which is really a monumental, monumental task. Uh, she was, of course, uh, has won several awards. Uh, I met her first when she won the Jameli Devi Award for Courageous Journalism, and it's been a friendship over the decades now, right? She was one of the youngest to receive it. She's received the Padmashri Award and several others, uh, 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 other awards for her writings on the socio-political milieu of the Northeast. She writes for The Telegraph, The Northeastern Times, Eastern Panorama, and she has authored a, an amazing book called Waiting for an Equal World, Gender in India's Northeast, and has contributed several chapters to books on particularly matriarchy and the matrilineal traditions of the Northeast, which are very fascinating, and inheritance rights, and so on and so forth. She herself has lived life on her own terms, and many of us around this table wish we had her courage to do so. So Patricia is someone who's been part of several peace building initiatives in the Northeast region. How do you speak to situations of violence where women build bridges of understanding between antagonistic groups because ethnicity is a big issue in the Northeast? What techniques of dialogue and reconciliation have they used? And do you believe that they bring special skills to the table? The ambassador mentioned it's important to be at the table. And some of us here uh, believe that it's also be important to be around the table so that the women at the table feel supported that there is this anchor around them. So how do we transform contentious relationships? Patricia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minakshi. It's a privilege to be sitting with this esteemed gathering of peace builders and aspirants for peace. I suppose all of us here yearn to be living in peace. But I come from a conflict zone and I know how difficult it is. It's easier to be speaking here, but once we get back home, we realize how difficult it is to talk peace to conflicting parties. And uh, from my lived experiences, I feel that uh, peace building should start during peace times. It's impossible to start peace, peace building uh, methods or strategies when two groups are in conflict. And uh, as I said earlier, I come from a region that shares only 1% of its boundary with India. 99% of our boundaries are with the rest of the world, with China, with Burma, with Nepal, with Bangladesh. And we are a very ethnically divided region. You know, uh, There has been no space created for women to transcend these ethnic boundaries. And therefore, the moment there are conflicts between two communities, the women also are expected to remain in their private zones. Anyone who tries to make overtures for peace is considered an outlier and she will get her just desserts from the community and the, we know the community is very male dominated even in a matrilineal state like ours. Uh, where then or how then do we create a platform for starting the conversation? In Manipur today we know that it's seven months running. We have a conflict that has been running for seven months. There are about 45,000 people living in relief camps. I visited some of the relief camps and there were women who gave birth 
uh, three women gave birth in one relief camp that had 257 people living in a room that was just 20 feet by 20 feet. So, and incidentally, we seem to have forgotten Manipur because we are all focused on Israel, Hamas conflict and other conflicts around the globe. Also because I think uh, we really don't know what to do. Uh, if somebody wants to come there to make peace, where do you start? Which place do you go to? You, you come to a state that has definite boundaries drawn today. The people from the valley cannot go to the hills. The people from the hills can't come down to the valley. Everything is disconnected. So you don't have health care in the hills. You don't have education in the hills. Everything is in the valley. And uh, there's just nobody to help bridge that divide. So you, you're really caught in a situation where you feel an utter sense of helplessness because the state as one of the, what should I say, the main uh, actor in the, in the whole conflict, if not, uh, I mean, may not have been the sole actor, at least uh, the central government may not have been part of the conflict, but at the level of the state, there is a definite role that the state has played to divide people. And uh, it's also my experience that nothing can trigger a conflict than by making people feel victims when they feel they've been wronged, when they feel the other side is taking away all the resources. You have a conflict ready and uh, you can expect people to respond irrationally to such situations. And sadly, as I said earlier, women who are part of the in-group uh, and respond in how they, they respond in how the narratives are created. And we know that narratives are always created by men because men are at the forefront of conflicts. And uh, anyone who even dares to step out and speak differently or think differently or even write differently is immediately countered, you know, and, uh, and, the, and the counter actions are very, very severe. People will come and vandalize your home, they'll burn up your home. So you, you don't want to be in the firing line if you have a family. And uh, the northeastern part of India is a region where there's always a constant fight for resources between ethnic groups, and that includes political resources, because we have a state where the constituencies are divided along ethnic lines. How can you then not have conflict? You know, if you have uh, 60 seats in Manipur, 40 people, 40 uh, representatives are from the valley, the rest 20 are from the hills. So it's, it's already a boiling pot. It's just waiting to topple over. And uh, it's unthinkable today to imagine the Meites and the Kukizo people to be meeting and talking. See, this could have happened during peace times and some bonds could have been built then. Maybe those bonds could have found some meaning during the conflict, but it has never been tried. And because we have this uh, very, very, you know, we have the peace activists who've lived and served and tried to build peace, I really hope that we can build solidarity and we can learn something from one another. We can have somebody to mentor us on how to build peace processes. Uh, we remember the, the Naga Mothers Association. I think all of us remember how in 1984 they came up because they saw that too many of their young sons were getting killed in the insurgency which is ongoing. There, there is a peace process, but it's, it's an ongoing conflict. So the Naga Mothers Association came forward to counter uh, the Indian Army. They, they, they didn't want the Indian Army to be, to be killing any more of their sons. They didn't want the insurgents also to recruit their sons. And Nagaland was also going through a very, very difficult phase of drug addiction. So the mothers came forward as a social group to try and handle the situation. And then there came a time when they said to the insurgent outfits, 
no more blood, shed no more blood. That was in 1994. And then in 1997, you have the different insurgent outfits signing a peace treaty yeah. with the government of India. Since then, till now, nothing has happened. The talks are still ongoing. Uh, but, and somebody asked me the other day, why are the Naga Mothers Association not doing something for Manipur? Now, we have to understand that the Naga Mothers Association cannot step beyond Nagaland. They cannot. And because the Nagas are also a part of the Manipur territory, and the Nagas are not saying anything on a conflict between the Meites and the Kukizos, so Naga Mothers Association can hardly be going and, you know, they'll be called interlopers. So they're not... They're not doing anything there. Now, I, I ask myself this question. Did the people of that region not apprehend that there was going to be this huge conflict that was going to take a toll of 175 lives or so, and about 1,400 homes burnt, and uh, 45,000 or more people in relief camps? Did they not foresee that something like this was going to happen? Why was such a thing not nipped in the bud? Where are the political tools? What, uh, I mean, what have we been living with all these years that we haven't learned any lessons? Because we've had a similar ethnic conflict in Manipur in 1992. So what lessons have we learned from the past? Why are these lessons not being used to counter conflict? Is it because the idea of civil society itself is non-existent in our region? I don't know if it is existing in this country because I can now feel only a stunning silence from all across. So when we look at Manipur today, one begins to ask oneself, is there a possibility for setting up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? <coughs> because there's so much injustice that has been done. If we do not find the truth, if we not, do not deal with the truth, we are going to have a very short-lived peace because uh, a lot of injustice has been wreaked on the tribals because, and I say this with responsibility because I've visited those tribal districts and found life to be so very difficult. The children are asking their, their parents today, when do we go back home? It's nearly Christmas. The parents have no answer because uh, there are no more homes to go to. All the homes were burnt. So you have to rebuild homes and rebuild lives. So who will make the first move? Have we as a nation of such diversity invested enough in peace building methods or strategies or whatever you want to call it? It's not an easy task, especially when women do not have the agency of voice. We have not been able to do that over the years. How do we first begin then to empower women to speak truth to power and to be listened to? Because if you're looking at the Naga Mothers Association, while they were responsible for bringing the insurgents to the peace talks table, the women were nowhere to be seen. As if women have no agenda. There were no women at the peace table. And this is the general trend. So we have to reverse this trend. And uh, we really, I'm really looking around this table to see if there's something I can take back home. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. Spoken really with the first hand experience of being engaged with people who are trying to find a way out of this conflict. And you were so correct about the demonization of the other, which is always precedes the outbreak mm -hmm. of overt conflict, like we saw in Rwanda between the Tutus and Hutsis, and when it actually blew up in everybody's face. Uh, but there's another aspect of it, which is a little disturbing, that one of the most uh, articulate and powerful women's groups that always stood for progressive politics in Manipur, the Mira Paibis, have become so complicit or at least parts of them have become complicit in the violence, which tells us that ethnic loyalties mm -hmm. override humanity sometimes. Yes. And perhaps people like you and the work that you do would find a way out of the impasse. 
but thank you very, very much. And for I'd like her another round of applause because she's traveled very far <laughs> to be here with us today. And uh, as soon as she got off the flight, there were large groups of people who wanted to listen to her, get her wisdom on things. And I have to tell you, I have to share with this group that if you go against your community, as I have done once in a while, <laughs> you you have the you know the prospect of getting a petrol bomb thrown at your house or you know millions of trolls getting at you but you still have to do it you still have to do it thank you thank you so much Patricia.